Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Berezin. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. We're just going to get right to it. Josh, go ahead and, and introduce our two guests today. So we are very lucky today to have Drs. Marie Brown and Nev Jones here with us on the podcast to talk about two open forums. One of them is Lived Experience Research Leadership and the Transformation of Mental Health Services, Building a Researcher Pipeline. And the second is Service User Participation Within the Mental Health System, Deepening Engagement. So uh, welcome to the podcast, uh, Drs. Jones and Brown. Thanks for having us. And uh, I should mention... Dr. Jones is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of South Florida, and Dr. Brown is a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. So welcome again, and I think we'll just start out with our usual question about how you both came to this uh, this area of research, and also maybe a little bit about how the two of you began to collaborate, since relationships are really a key part of the uh, things we're going to be talking about as we go go on today. Okay. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and relevant, actually, Marie and I were like, we were texting about this yesterday <laughs> in, in an attempt to remember exactly how we met, um, which was at least 11 or 12 years ago. So we've been friends a very long time um, and working wow. together. Uh, as far as we can reconstruct, it came about <laughs> because we were both at the time working on developing hearing voices networks in our respective cities, Marie in New York City, me in Chicago. Um, Marie wasn't in grad school yet and I had only just started. And then that evolved into a friendship certainly, but also then uh, I think our first collaborative research project was actually a national survey of hearing voices network facilitators in the the U.S. that we published probably in 2014 or so. And what was the, the genesis of the collaboration on these particular articles? So we are also both part of a group comprised of researchers and students with lived experience and allies uh, focused on really sort of the things that we're here to talk about today, um, building kind of capacity and building supports for primarily early career researchers who are trying to navigate this often very difficult landscape. And then sort of also a focus on bringing community members, you know, without academic training um, more meaningfully into to research. And so that, that sort of network for a period we were having sort of early career meetings and sort of the discussions there evolved into the first piece. <laughs> so the, the sort of uh, building a pipeline piece. And then I think we sort of realized that there were things that we didn't cover and just through conversations, Marie and I then, you know, kind of ended up developing the second piece. So they really are like complementary and cover different but interrelated things. Yeah, I remember also, I think like a while back, we were kind of taking, we had started doing some of this work from another angle where we were thinking about writing these kind of like demystification guides for people with lived experience who wanted to enter into graduate programs. You know, and I remember when we were writing that, you know, some of the things that we kind of talk about in this article, we were saying, you know, oh, you know, encouraging people to like not talk about your lived experience necessarily on an application and realizing that that's going to be a sticking point and then kind of through this, we were like, actually, maybe uh, that needs to be spoken about um, as something that's really important to kind of challenge that idea um, of kind of having people conceal things about themselves. So why don't we start with that, since we're already talking about it, why don't we start with that, um, that open forum on building the researcher pipeline for people with lived experience. Maybe we can just take a step back and talk about where the push to um, have people live experience involved in mental health research came from and when did that advocacy start and what what was it responding to? What was the landscape? Yeah, so there's sort of been parallel developments 
in different regions of the world. Um, in terms of research involvement specifically, I think the UK is often looked to as sort of the international leader, but I think the common underlying theme is just really sort of nothing about us without us. So obviously research has a huge impact on policy and what services look like, what are recognized as problems or gaps and what you know end up invisible. So I think for a long time with varying degrees of sort of power and momentum behind that, depending on the country, there has been this push for trying to sort of overcome this huge disjuncture between sort of a research workforce that largely does not reflect, especially more significant psychiatric disabilities, you know, what we would call sort of serious mental illness and then serious substance use as well. And then all the things that start to intersect with those experiences like poverty and homelessness and structural racism, et cetera. So the sort of the push is to say that there's a injustice on multiple levels when all this research is being conducted and services are being developed without the inclusion of the target population. And then I think over time, and this is true even in the UK, you see and initially saw kind of a lot of very superficial, well, let's have a stakeholder advisory board on the services side relevant to our engagement piece, like let's let people in as peer workers, but of course they're at the absolute bottom of the hierarchy. And in a similar way in research, somebody who's just a consultant or advisor in reality, right? It's, it's really minimal their ability to in a deeper and more substantive way, really redirect research blaze more innovative areas because often it's sort of an after the fact inclusion like we're doing this project but can you tell us sort of you know can you maybe inform smaller decisions we might make along the way so I think that sort of deeper change only comes when people are involved in a way that they are either leadership in the truest sense or have substantive power to to influence decision making and that remains I think very, very unusual, especially in, you know, powerful research centers or settings Mm -hmm. that are attracting a lot of NIH funding. Do you have like a paradigm in your, your mind of what meaningful participation would look like or, or have you, do you know of any research groups who do this well, or you've read a paper and you've been like, they're actually, this is real. This is like the real deal and not just a, a token involvement. Most of my experiences where I felt like this was meaning, like a meaningful collaboration have been outside of the research world. You know, I think like something like, like the Hearing Voices movement is a really good example of genuine collaboration where from the foundation of that movement, it was always like a collaboration between, you know, people with lived experience, voice hearers and clinicians and activists. And um, like another like good example is there's this place called the Institute for the Development of Human Arts here in New York. And again, it was founded, it was created from the ground up by um, a collaborative effort. So as Nev was saying, it wasn't clinicians created this thing or researchers created this thing and said, okay, now you can come and, and have an advisory role. It was like really developed as a collaboration. And I think that those types of things are the most, the, that promote the deepest engagement. Mm-hmm. I mean, a, a kind of just somewhat more traditional research example so I, I, I often talk about Andrew Gumley, who is a early psychosis and psychosis researcher in Scotland. And I got to visit his lab, his center a couple years ago. And the majority of everybody from, you know, the highest level kind of postdoctoral project directors down to undergraduate RAs, the majority have personal experience of psychosis and many have gone through early intervention and psychosis services. And that's sort of supported all the way up. So, right. And then um, there's sort of both traditional and non-traditional pathways whereby, you know, some, some people have started to work for him as as sort of service user representatives or consultants, and some were already sort of students. 
but in both cases, sort of supporting them to then enter PhD programs and, and get PhDs. So it's that, you know, again, sort of really creating that that kind of continuum where, you know, you start to support people early on and then sort of nurture their development where I think we don't see, we really see a glass ceiling at the faculty level. So I know very, very few people of my sort of cohort of friends nationally when I was in grad school who had personal experience of significant psych disabilities essentially nobody has gotten into even an entry level faculty kind of position. So I think that remains a challenge, but, you know, I think at least like with Andrew's lab, you really see what that could start to look like and how transformative it is when it's not just sort of one voice or consultants, but really that the majority of the people or a large number of the people making all these different diverse kinds of decisions about a project and about what to do next and what's important are, have had the same experiences that are being, you know, that are being targeted. I wanted to just ask a couple of questions that, that are a little slightly off the point, but I'm curious what you guys think. So do you believe what, that say, let's take the National Institute of Diabetes Care, okay, or uh, the National, you know, the, the Cancer Center. Do you think that the same standard of participation and inclusion should apply? If we were talking about applied, you know, so if we're talking about like, I don't know, toxicology or genetic assays or something, no, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that about sort of like basic brain research either. I think yes. And actually the irony is that probably more is happening in that space is that actually in sort of applied health services research on cancer, there is huge kind of championing of CBPR and participatory methods in the US and just in general sort of public health, not the sort of public mental health side, but like public health vis-a-vis -vis physical conditions and physical disabilities is, is really far ahead. And also really bringing that in on the sort of health equity, racial equity side in a really big way. So the, the key in the US, the main textbooks on participatory research are actually all focused on physical health conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not sure what historically would help to explain why that has sort of dropped out much more when it comes to psychiatric issues and maybe especially sort of serious you know, what we categorize as, as serious mental illness and, and, and psychosis. So, so let me just follow that up then, because it seems to me you're talking about more than participatory research. You're actually talking mm -hmm. about running the research, right? And mm -hmm. being in charge. And so, and I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just trying to, to see if the same standards apply. And it sounds like what you're saying is yes, if it has to do like with, if any of the work has to do with how the particular challenge impacts people and their lives and, and their choices and their behavior and their service utilization. Just like, a, I think a quick thing to say is that we see this in disabilities. So across disability areas in, in the sort of autism world, there's been a huge push for autistic researchers and autistic leadership in research. So I think part of it has to do with, we wouldn't see that in dementia because people are developing dementia way later in life. They've mostly already retired. So I think where it's either a childhood or early adult onset kind of disability and is for the most part lifelong, it makes a lot more sense because people are in fact positioned to be leaders in a way that maybe isn't possible across every different, mm -hmm. you know, kind of health condition. Sorry, Marie, though, go, go for it. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think like there's a large piece about also why it's so important in terms of mental health and substance is because there's this element of um, like major discrimination that's like associated with those um, experiences. And so I think that that's kind of why you would see it more is because it's not um, sort of just about implementing interventions um, and asking the right questions, but it's also kind of trying to show a commitment to anti-discrimination or anti-stigma. As a researcher, I find it interesting that, you know, the, sort of the characterization of research as being so impactful <laughs> when in a lot of research in the mental health research world, there's a, there's a persistent depression that that it does that that the work doesn't make a difference and that research is entirely disconnected from the actual practice and so I mean to me that makes your second article the second open forum even more important and, and I would also you know I do think that people who are researchers do tend to have a voice perhaps not about their research uh, but anyway, I was curious what you thought about um, that perspective I think yeah. just turning to my own experiences as a patient, I did not find that true. Um, so particularly in interactions with psychiatrists around antipsychotics, where almost everything you might try to contest or push back on about side effects or discontinuation or clozapine, is almost always framed. Now, whether it's a real reflection of where research is really at and the level of sort of controversy, but it's very much couched in terms of research and that creates a really okay. pronounced power dynamic. You're sort of on one side and they have sort of the authority of this research literature behind what they're saying. And then the same thing about, I think, diagnosis and psychopathology, right? So when you're saying the way that you're sort of describing, this isn't mapping onto my reality and the way I experience quote unquote delusions or voices is really, really different. There's this sort of fall back to what research has established putatively about what schizophrenia or psychosis is. And I think, you know, also there it is, it's very much how clinicians have been trained to think about schizophrenia or psychosis or any other condition, right, in a certain way. And, you know, those textbooks are, you know, kind of full of their references to the research literature. So, so sort of experientially, I actually think there's a huge amount of power there. Now, not necessarily in this particular therapy or intervention being well implemented, but when it comes to this underlying conceptualization there is not only, I think, kind of tremendous power and influence coming from the research space, but it's very hard to feel as a, like, as a patient that you have even a chance of mm. meaningfully kind of pushing back against that. And for me, just personally, the first set of projects I did when I finally got into graduate school in psychology was, were on the phenomenology of psychosis, because there was such a huge discrepancy between everything I experienced and how I felt it was being conceptualized and formulated. And then when I started actually leading hearing voices groups, I think I went many years thinking it's just me. And then I'm like, oh no, it's not just me. Almost everything I'm hearing does not conform to this very kind of narrow, rigid DSM or PAN's way of conceptualizing people's experiences. Now there, I mean, talk about epistemic kind of injustice, right? Literally, we have created this conceptualization, this version of what psychosis in these different domains are. People who have never experienced that overwhelmingly, even though it's all based on sort of self-report ostensibly. So I think that is also sort of disanalogous to diabetes or cancer and also like psychosis and, and really all of these psychiatric conditions fundamentally implicate the self, right? Self and identity in really profound ways. And if we lose sight of that and that drops out of the equation, it has actually, I think, potentially really 
damaging consequences in terms of what services look like and these gaps in communication and missed communication because that understanding isn't there and because the conceptualization has been arrived at in a pretty radically unequal way. I also, I, you know, I kind of like thinking about it from, I guess, a positive sort of angle uh, about, you know, the research and research's impact. And I think one of the, the reasons why I think these two papers are so important is because I think research has the potential to have even more of an impact when it involves people with lived experience. Um, I think one good example we have that's really so like very closely related to what we're talking about is sort of like the AIDS crisis, you know, and like people who used drugs were like, you know, hey, we need to give people clean syringes. And then researchers came in and studied this and were like, hey, you know what, this isn't increasing HIV, you know, AIDS, this is actually decreasing it. And that was like, you know, that's an example of like a synergy between these two um, groups of people that really created change in the world. Wow, both, both of you, thank you so much for those responses. It's really powerful. I mean, it's also just, uh, you know, all this is so thought stimulating, just intellectually thinking about um, kind of reframing how think about research. And there's such a push, I think, in medical training right now towards evidence-based medicine. And you just miss all the kind of, once you get down to the interaction between the clinician and the, the patient, you've, you've lost sort of all the nuances of where that evidence came from and what were the assumptions that led to that evidence. And once you're on the individual level, you've got somebody reading recommendations for how you are supposed to, what the evidence says, and, and you lose what Nev, you were saying about that this involves a power dynamic that is baked in baked into the, to the research. Um, and so it's, it's hard to shake it if you're just shooting for the, the individual level because there's so much that's already, that's already gone into it. Okay, so what are we gonna do about this? Uh, well, you're, both of your papers are great because they're, they're so rich intellectually and then they're also very concrete uh, in terms of next steps. So, so for, the, for the pipeline paper, what are some of the, the next steps that the, the research community um, and academia should be should be taking to address these issues. So I think one you know one that we talked a lot about is really kind of just changing the atmosphere and culture, whether it's in training programs, graduate programs, fellowships, um, and also in like research centers, right around kind of proactive inclusion, and also I think on a more emotional affective level tying into our second open forum, understanding what it's often like to be that one person in those spaces whose experiences are being sort of like objectified in front of you. And you have to sort of duly navigate the sort of the lived experience of that, which is often so so different in many ways, right? It's, and the people that you care about. So, you know, I think we can, Marie and I can circle back around to this, but when a lot of your friends fall in these categories too, it's not just, you know, kind of clients or something that you're relatively distant from or research subjects. It's like, these are people who you deeply care about who in real time are probably experiencing the things that are being discussed in this much more, you know, neutral way. At worst, there's sort of, you know, kind of a constant just sort of pathologization that happens in these spaces. So something that is very central to your sense of self and identity in complex ways is, you know, always sort of spoken of as a, as a problem, as something to be targeted or issues like non-adherence, right? So I think that that's actually very, very stressful. It's really hard on people. And that isn't, recognized and i think those kinds of shifts are harder to are harder to bring about but some of it might be just sort of stopping to think what might this conversation feel like to somebody who actually has these experiences who might be in the room or maybe you even know that they're in the room but you know you can actually never never know definitively that that nobody is in the room who has has had those experiences and 
Second, I think just some relatively simple things like proactive hiring, which I think it's very unusual to see in the U.S., making it kind of, you know, front and center in announcements, whether they're for volunteer RAs or paid RAs or graduate students that we would deeply value um, students or applicants with the experiences we're studying. So let's say that's a a harm reduction lab or it's a psychosis lab, right? That obviously becomes the, the thing that's it's really most important to center. And even just the messaging conveyed by, you know, really like kind of creating this sense of we would really deeply value somebody with this experience. We see it sort of sometimes around culture and language. So it's not a total outlier in that sense but one almost never sees it about sort of target psychiatric or substance use conditions. And then I think then, you know, kind of then you go from there, right? Then you start to sort of hire people and you invest in them. I mean, so mentoring is just a huge piece of it and mentoring them to really sort of develop their own ideas, which is really starts to depart from sort of consultation models, right? It's like, what are the burning questions in, in your mind and how can I support you to ask them or to develop this project, which is, you know, kind of how I approach mentoring. And then I think people really start to blossom because it's like these questions often stemming from their own experience originally that they don't see reflected anywhere. And it's like empowering them to actually ask them to put together this research project and be able to demonstrate something that they have felt and experienced, but not been able to communicate or seen, right? Seen in their community, seen in their friends, seen in other clients in their programs. I was uh, just reminded um, that I think over the summer, actually, Nev, I think you sent this to me that in um, Britain, the uh, their like uh, psychological association released this paper that was essentially saying people with lived experience are extremely val valuable to the profession of clinical psychology and. So I think like, wow, what, what would that be like if our, you know, American Psychiatric Association or our American Psychological Association made such a statement? So just to follow up on this, this challenge to welcome and um, invite and emphasize, you know, really go after in some ways people with, I think, the way that you talk about it in the paper, psychiatric disability lived experience. So it's what, P PDLE. Implicit in, in, in this promotion of the inclusion of individuals, does that mean that people have to self-disclose? So no, I don't think so. I think that when you, so like, uh, like I'm kind of a magnet for people, for undergraduates and young people with personal experience of psychosis who come to me. I don't, I don't have to like recruit for them, right? There's a lot of people out there really in rather desperate need of mentoring and support. And if they feel like there's somebody they can turn to, they do. I mean, when we would get to sort of it's a problem that how do we know? I mean, I think if it's really clear that you, that one is like kind of supporting that people are going to come to you. And I think the same thing in, in the UK in centers that have really establish themselves as sort of leaders in inclusion and have multiple staff who are disclosed. I mean, it certainly is really helpful for more senior people to disclose, right? So that that's clear. Then they're gonna be approached with all kinds of interest. There's on the listserv recently, right, Marie, we've, we've, I think we've posted two or three, none in the US, but like in Australia and the UK, explicit PhD studentships in which mm -hmm. the central valued category is lived experience, I am sure that they are then like inundated with applications and people who, because that's what it's about, realize that like, here's, here's somewhere where I can disclose and be open. So I don't think that it's that we would have to ask, but I think that people have, there has to be some trust mm -hmm. and some believability mm -hmm. that this is actually going to be an environment that embraces me and embraces these aspects of myself and around disclosure, which I know mo both Marie and I, uh, you know, are regularly giving advice to, to students applying like to, to grad programs. 
that's the fear. It's not that people don't want to disclose. It's it's a fear of recrimination, discrimination, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not that they don't feel comfortable or feel like, oh, I shouldn't have to say something that personal. It's like, I desperately want to be able to say that. And at every turn, I'm just afraid that I'm going to be judged, not accepted, you know, moved mm-hmm. to the you know, move to the reject pile just because of this, or really, really struggling because even though they've had disruptions to their education because of psych disability, they can't explain that. It's Mm -hmm. agonizing to see people have to come up with some alternative way because if they explain these disruptions in terms of significant psych issues, they feel like they'll then be Mm -hmm. rejected. Mm -hmm. Or helping people reframe being like a former peer specialist. Like, okay, let's think about how you could talk about that on an application so you don't aren't disclosing that you had a major mental health issue. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, HR, you know, and what, what does HR say about putting these kinds of things in your job descriptions? And I think the way you framed it makes perfect sense. Um, it's, just, it's just something that's valued. It's not required. Um, and then it's all about the, the, the environment that you create. Right. I always think of it as sort of like, imagine like applying for like a, like, like a literature PhD program, but you have to hide the fact that you've read Shakespeare and you can't <laughs> <laughs> talk about Shakespeare. Like it has a similar feel. Uh, <laughs> So let's uh, let's switch gears to the to the second open forum, which I think one of you described as a twin or maybe a cousin, um, some close relation to the uh, to to what we've already been discussing. So I think a lot of the themes are gonna um, same themes are gonna come up. But I th- I think ne- Nev, you were talking earlier about how after you wrote the the pipeline paper came first, and then you realized that there was something missing or something more you wanted to say. What was that? What was that piece that you wanted to address in this the second? open forum, which is, again, um, on deepening engagement on um, service user participation within the, the, the mental health system. Yeah, so here, let me really defer to, to Marie. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, Marie was really like the, 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 the lead on writing this, this piece. I think part of it is, you know, I'll, OK, I'll just start a little bit, but then I'm going to defer to Marie. <laughs> Right, like this is how we met, kind of going back to how we met, right? We we met working in the context of the Hearing Voices movement. The first research project we did together, which for also for both of us was one of our earliest research projects, was the entire research team were all Hearing Voices movement facilitators. So we were joined by Kaki Marino um, out on the West Coast. And we wanted to sort of understand like, you know, what's happening in this space this is a really diverse, rich space. So, you know, sometimes in popular media, the Hearing Voices Network might be just sort of characterized in some relatively monothetic way, but it's not. It's full of all these diverse perspectives and people with different points of view. And it's this really rich landscape. And then Marie and I have been involved, of course, now for many, many years, have lots of friends, right, who are involved. And it's sort of like this cognitive dissonance then it's like this whole parallel world of work that's happening and ways that people are thinking about distress that is almost completely disconnected from sort of the research world and I think it's part like you know Marie and I really have that kind of in common and then coming to terms with this odd cognitive dissonance or disjuncture like why are these two things so separate yeah, I guess and one of the things that we were we were wondering if one of the things that could be happening is in um, research, you see maybe less of a tolerance for kind of embracing all of the different kind of like affect and pain and all of these kind of experiences that are very kind of um, central to hearing voices work that people work th- through um, in that in that movement. So that was sort of one one aspect of what we were thinking in terms of this second paper is what what's like getting in the way of having such a a process and research. Mm-hmm. So just to take a step back, you in the beginning of the 
this uh, the engagement open forum, you talk about the, the radical roots of peer support and then kind of contrast it with uh, what's what's developed over the, the past 50 years. Can you just sort of briefly give us a flavor of that, um, what, it, what it was and sort of what it's become? So I think early on, you really saw the impetus being a, a, the, the creation of alternatives, right? So a lot of the organizing happening in the United States in the late 70s and 80s was creating sort of models of support that were completely ground up. And, and sort of led by people with shared experiences, which at the time were largely of sort of institutionalization and deinstitutionalization and having to sort of make it in the world again, following institutionalization in, you know, largely state hospitals, um, et cetera. And then, you know, we see the sort of advent of peer support and certification in the states and then these you know, kind of integration of peer support workers within traditional settings, but not across leadership levels, right? So sort of at the bottom where actually one's ability to meaningfully influence things is pretty minimal. And sort of the value ascribed in a sort of structural sense is actually further reinforced by these, you know, kind of bottom of the barrel wages most often sometimes you know no benefits even when it's not a matter of like ssi because often that's sort of you know oh that's why we don't pay people very much or don't include benefits or keep it less than half time um and so so we've kind of created this workforce that's not really integrated in the deeper sense but is kind of segregated and siloed and hierarchically positioned at the bottom of things and I think we still see in parallel happening, like a lot of that sort of creativity and what is a real true alternative here. In other words, not just sort of an incremental softening of sort of power relationships and hierarchies and stuff such as they are in the traditional system. And again, sort of the hearing voices movement is a good example of that. So there's like, you know, kind of a whole set of techniques that have kind of co-developed and co-evolved with clinical allies as well as voice hearers that include things like voice mapping and voice dialogue. And so it's, it's, it's not actually just this sort of generic peer support at all in that space, right? It's actually a lot of substance there around how we might rethink the experience of voice hearing, reconceptualize it, and actually support people to sort of unpack those experiences and map them out. So I think that's sort of an example and one doesn't really see that happening in the in the peer workforce. So, you know, I think that that's kind of what we were, the kind of thing we were, we were sort of trying to get at is like why it makes in, you know, in a deeper sense, it makes no sense that there's not dialogue and conversation going on when such rich work is happening. And of course, also important and influential work is happening on the research side, but these things are just, they're like in, happening in parallel worlds. Some of the, some of the history I, I, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, it seems like it's very much in the context of the disability rights movement of the, of the 60s and 70s, um, which was like a radical movement. Like it was, it, it was very much like trying to change society on a fundamental level and it sounds like that work is still going on but it and that is sort of what the grassroots are still doing but it hasn't translated and it's been kind of um sanitized into something that just doesn't doesn't reflect how that this should be really uh, kind of paradigm shifting uh, rather around the edges mm-hmm. um so we talked a little bit about in, in this idea that all of these rich variety of ideas are being flattened down to kind of one monolith in that translation is one issue and that suggests uh, one obvious solution. Um, the other part of the, the paper that you talk about is uh, about affect and um, some like relational psychotherapy concepts. And I just, I, I love I loved all the papers, uh, everything, but I really found this to be like very, 
just very engaging and um, fascinating. So what what is what is you know relational psychotherapy have to do with deepening engagement and service user participation? Yeah, I think, you know, when we were writing this paper, we were looking for places that already exist in the mental health system that have similar ideas. And, um, you know, one of the things that I kind of thought about was this sort of postmodern turn in the way that we think about like psychotherapy, where a lot of times you know, the relational psychotherapy, um, you know, breaks down this distinction essentially between like a patient and a clinician and realizes that um, both people have d- generate knowledge, that it's not like one person operating on another person and that um, both people in the end essentially benefit from, from this interaction. So that was kind of like why we were thinking about that is like, okay, well, you know, in in the world of psychotherapy, we see that there's this kind of mutuality happening there. And then also in the world of psychotherapy, we realize that affect is like so important that um, when people can experience affect, that's like when change occurs in their lives. So kind of taking these principles that are within like the clinical realm and then thinking about them in terms of mental health activism research, that was sort of how we started thinking about that. And of course, like the peer support world has always been about that since, since the beginning of time, this sense of like mutuality. I mean, one of, when I was reading it, one of my reactions is it's, it's an, another example of we're supposed to be good at this. You know, like these are the things that mental health professionals are supposed to know how to do, uh, you know, build relationships, tolerate affect, incorporate different points of view. Like this is, should be our bread and butter. Like this should be so easy for us to do, but we don't apply it outside. And it makes like perfect sense to people when they're sitting with a client, right? And then to shift it outside of that dyadic, as you say, inter- interaction onto something that's more holistic or outside of that, it's like, oh, I don't know how to do that. Like, how could we, how could we possibly do that? So how do we do it? <laughs> uh, one of the great things about the paper is that. To, to, to add to what Marie was saying, which I think we kind of recommend, I mean, if it doesn't rise to the level of friendship, getting to know people in a deeper way. So I think often what we see, whether it's a policy setting and it's bringing in a panel or kind of bringing in stakeholder consultants to, I don't know, a SAMHSA event or something, or whether it's research, it's this sort of very limited kind of interaction, transactional interaction around, we need certain things from you and there's huge distance and that isn't broken down to getting to know people and forging deeper relationships. And I think if that did happen, it would be so much more powerful. It would lead to, you know, it would really like start to inspire change. And part of that is because you're now entering emotionally into that relationship. It's not just a source of information in this sort of dry, relatively dry sense. It's you really starting to understand where somebody is coming from and why maybe they have experienced disempowerment the way they have. Like you start to, 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 to kind of feel into those experiences and you care about the people and you care about the communities. And it also means that then when those whether they're research or policy or other kinds of conversations do take place, there's a whole different kind of trust. And on that foundation of trust, people are going to open up. And, and I think often being an intermediary role, the hard thing for me is that I know how the stakeholders involved are actually feeling about a given mm-hmm. research effort. And in fact, they feel there's no way I could say what I really think. There's no way that I would feel comfortable saying this doesn't seem at all equal to me. I don't feel like I can speak my mind openly. They tell it to me. And of course you have to sort of protect them. So you can't talk about that. It's it's really heartbreaking. And again, I feel like just that deeper work across these different contexts, there just have to be those relationships. And then everything that that starts to shift about how somebody who is a policymaker or researcher or clinician is now engaging with those, with those individuals and attunement and awareness to these sort of deeper contours of experience and what it means to have probably been repeatedly sort of 
put in this kind of more passive role because that's sort of how you move through the system in general as a client and how you have to support people to feel even the confidence to really step outside of that unless they've already sort of become a full-fledged activist, right? And have sort of repositioned themselves in that way. You know, it's um, your comment makes me think of a recent experience I had, and, and I know this is superficial, but, but I think it's going in the right direction. I was a part of a work group that's focused on disparities and, and racism. And we didn't, the people in the work group didn't really know each other. So we did an icebreaker and each person had to say what they thought they'd want to be remembered for mm. when they died. Now, it, it, was, it, it took a long time, to, you know, going around the room. But it totally changed how I think, you know, we related and understood each other and was a great foundation for moving forward in some of the ways that, that, that you describe, even though I think it's just the beginning. But it, 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 and it's interesting that it's around racism that I think we're, we're white, you know, white people, I mean, like myself, we are, I'm, I'm learning. But it's, it's really the same across a number of different, I think, stigmatized and undervalued um, and, and people groups. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, Murray, the question I wanted to ask is, you know, you're in a kind of a somewhat unusual position in having had very long and sustained interaction and friendships with activists within the the sort of more grassroots mental health space, including the Hearing Voices movement. And you yourself are a practicing clinical psychologist. And I just wondered if you could also sort of talk about how beyond the relationships that of course you have in a clinical capacity, how it has sort of changed your work and your perspective, these friendships and involvement in these, um, you know, non-clinical activists or advocacy spaces. When I went into clinical psychology, I experienced a major disconnect because I had spent a lot of my time like in the hearing voices movement. So I kind of learned from people with lived experience and then I moved into the clinical world. So for me, it was a little bit jarring. Like I'll never forget, like, you know, one time we were talking about someone with psychosis and, and uh, it was like a kind of clinical presentation and someone had said, you know, the person thinks they're, the, the person thinks that they're the devil, what would you do if someone had said this? And my immediate response was like, you know, I would ask them what it felt like to be the devil, what that meant to them. And this was kind of like, whoa, like you don't want to be asking, you don't want to be feeding the delusion that the person is having. So I think that, I mean, I think that my experiences in the hearing voices movement, like by far made me a better clinician, like willing to, like kind of trust the process and realize that people have their own strength inside of them. Um, and that if you kind of can tolerate the discomfort or something that seems kind of counterintuitive, that this is really going to like help move somebody forward. I also think that it's really opened my mind to just like, hey, like, you know, we really don't know what voices are. Like, we, you know, like there's so many interpretations and so many meanings there. And, you know, who am I to really know? Um, and so I think all of those things have, ha have helped me in my clinical work. So in the article, you've, you've identified these, these issues around grassroots pluralism and affect and relationships. So what do we do? What do we do now? What are the next steps? One thing we were thinking was just exposing yourself to a lot of different perspectives. You know, I know that I... I really like to like sign up for listservs and some of them might not necessarily be, um, you know, aligned with how I think about things. So I'm um, kind of learning about things like Schizophrenia Anonymous at the same time that you're learning about things like Hearing Voices Network. So kind of just exposing yourself to just like the richness, the complexity, the diversity in what is like the peer consumer survivor movement. I, just, I wanted to point out that the paper, actually both papers, have supplements and by all rights they should actually not be supplements so that's that's an issue for the editor 
um, because they're so important to the paper and they're so great. So with, with the second paper that we've been talking about, there's a really cool supplement and it's just one page and it's a table that says activities designed to deepen engagement. And everybody should print this out and put it on their bulletin board and hold themselves accountable to, to doing uh, the things that are suggested here. So for example, as Marie already said, joining one or more activist or advocacy listservs or discussion groups that are open to the public reading diverse blogs, asking questions about experience, including feelings. For example, having conversations with service user consultants or advisory board members in informal contexts to understand how they actually feel. And those are at the individual level. And then there are a number of suggestions at the organizational level, inviting speakers, organizing events that, that really create bonding and getting to know people and know one another beyond just the kind of the surface stuff that we talk about at work. So I, I wanted to, I, I think the, both of the supplements in both articles provide the road, the roadmap for at least the next step. Obviously it's not everything, but it's, it's, it's for people who, who want to contribute to progress and, and what they can do. So I just wanted to wrap up with a quote from the, the second paper, because I think it just encapsulates everything we've talked about so, so well. Um, so you, you write that the simple but radical step that we propose in this context is to engage others in order to listen, and most important, to listen in order to be moved. Once moved, we suspect the field would in turn be much better able to tackle the structural and institutional changes that could in turn facilitate addressing other gaps and limitations noted earlier. So... With that, that I, I wanted to thank you very much for joining us today and and having a discussion and and forging um, forging a relationship uh, just between the four of us in this brief hour. But <laughs> it's definitely been an example of the sort of thing that you're you're talking about in the paper, where I think my and I hope our listeners and 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 Elisa's just sort of vocabulary and context gets expanded, maybe even just like a little or sometimes a lot, and it can really affect the way that we treat people and, and uh, go about our daily lives. So thank you so much, uh, and we appreciate your time. That was one of the most thought-provoking, engaging interviews I can remember. Not that all our other podcasts aren't good, but... <laughs> That's it for today. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org, to read the articles we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournalatpsych.org. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Berzin. Thank you for listening. We will talk to you next time.